On Monday, we spoke about the mysterious Voynich Manuscript, a manuscript from the 15th century. This, of course, is a manuscript with an unrecognizable language. We know that the Voynich Manuscript spent a lot of time with the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II. Rudolf II was also a part of the very strange and very powerful Habsburg dynasty. We know that Rudolf II was obsessed with the occult and spent a lot of time in his own little closet playing with his occult knickknacks. Now, there was one other book in Rudolf's personal collection. And this book, Rudolf himself was slightly obsessed with. This particular book would have the people of Rudolf's court gossiping like crazy. They feared that Rudolf himself was into Satanism and possibly into demonology. So what was this particular book? But before we go any further, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and give us a like if you would like to join our Patreon to help support the channel. There is a link down below. I also want to get, give a shout out to our producer, Tiffany Monroe, and her nonprofit here in Atlanta. A link to Tiffany's businesses will be listed down below, along with a snippet from a novel that one of our community members has written on multiverse. Now again, Adam's contact is in the description box below if you are a publisher or know a publishing house that can help him get his book published. It is a very, very good book. Also, we are being shadow banned. A lot is going on right now across all social media platforms, especially for those of us who aren't following the narrative of the deep state. Our Instagram and our Twitter is also listed down below. We're not, or I'm not on Twitter that much, but if you wanna give us a follow on social media, please do so and please know that we are being shadow banned. So if you tried to find us before following the link and you couldn't, that was probably why. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we're gonna to be talking about the Codex Gingas. Gingas translates in Latin to big or giant book. The Codex Gingas is also known as the Devil's Bible. Now this should not be confused with the Satanic Bible. It's very different. The Codex Gingas was written in the 13th century and it is about 165 pounds and three feet tall. It takes more than one person to move this book. The Codex Gingas is rumored to be the devil's Bible because of its origins. Now there is a painting of the devil in the middle of the book. It's a very famous painting from the Codex Gingas. And in fact, Looking at the painting, the devil is positioned on the right side. Normally this side is put aside for Jesus or God, and the left being the demonic side. But however, in the Codex Gingas, it appears that the left side opposite the devil is heaven. We know that the Codex Gingas was created by someone called Hermanus Inclusus. This was Herman the Recluse. Now, legend states that Herman was a monk living in the 13th century in Bohemia in a monastery. Now, apparently Herman had done something so evil, he had broken his vows that his punishment was death. Now, to be fair to Herman, back in the 13th century, it did not take a whole lot to warrant the death penalty. For Herman, people believed that his death was going to be walled into a room where he would eventually just die a slow, agonizing death. This is very, very similar to our discussion on Glam's castle and some of the legends that come from that castle as well. Well, the story goes that as the final bricks were being laid 
into Herman's basically death room, he screamed to the abbot for mercy. Well, the abbot made a deal with Herman that if he could write a book in one night that would encompass all of human knowledge, that his sins would be pardoned. Well, of course, in desperation, Herman agreed to this challenge. And in through the small opening that was available, the abbot gave Herman a bunch of calf and donkey skins, which is what they wrote on back then, and some ink. Well, Herman got to work and around midnight, Herman realized that there was no way he was going to finish this task. And so Herman did the unthinkable in his desperate hour of need. He made a prayer and a pact with the devil himself to help him complete this Codex Gingas. And sure enough, the devil appeared and for the price of Herman's eternal soul, the devil finished the book in one night. Because of Herman signing the book in Clusus, that is what gave way to the myth. But you see, a lot of scholars today believe that that simply could have just meant Herman the recluse. Because you see, a lot of scholars believe that completing this book in one night was impossible. Of course it's impossible according to the myth that only the devil could finish it in one night. But what if Herman did not sell his soul to the devil? And what if he was just a recluse in the monastery and spent 30 years creating the Codex Gingas? It still doesn't mean that this is not a book dedicated to the devil. For that, my opinion is still unsure. We do know that even though realistically it would have taken about 30 years to complete this Codex Gingas, not one point does the penmanship slip up. In fact, from beginning to end of the book, it's perfect penmanship, no errors. Even historians are shocked because within a 30 year period, eyesight starts to go, age, arthritis creeps in, and you can see in a lot of older pieces where the penmanship starts to crack a little bit. You can probably see that with your own penmanship, times when you're tired versus times when you're focused. So it's pretty miraculous that throughout this whole codex, there is not one mistake. Scholars also believe that this was created by one single hand. The handwriting matches itself throughout the whole book. This was a one-man job. This wasn't a, a tag team. It was one guy. Probably Herman, since he's the one who signed it. Now, another interesting thing to point out about the Codex Gingas. Regardless of whether it took one night as a pact to the devil or over 30 years as an agreement to the devil, we do know that there are about 10 to 12 pages missing. People believe that these 10 to 12 pages list the devil's prayer. This was the specific prayer that Herman prayed for the devil to appear and help him finish the book. Something also very interesting to mention about the Codex Gingas is that there are many exorcisms written about in this book. And the thing about these exorcisms that are different from modern day exorcisms is that it listed the demons' names. This is not common. It was almost like an homage to these particular demons. The Codex Gingas also has a complete copy of the Vulgate Bible. Now, this was the first Latin translation of the Bible. And even though the Codex Gingas was written in the 13th century, the Vulgate Bible was not recognized by the Catholic Church until the 16th century. Now, it is important to mention that the Vulgate Bible is without the Book of Acts and Revelation. You also had such books as Antiquities of the Jews, Isidore of Seville's Encyclopedia, Cosmos of Prague, who was a priest and an historian from Bohemia who lived between 1045 AD and 1125 AD. The Codex Gingas also included a lot of medical findings of that time, which we spoke about with the Voynich Manuscript. You see, a lot of times the medical findings were seen to be satanic by the church, 
during this weird part of history. The Codex Gingas also included two of the books from Constantine of Africa. You see, Constantine was a physician who lived in the 11th century, the same time as Cosmos. This book also included two different styles of Hebrew alphabet, along with other alphabets recognized at that time. Obviously, this is quite an impressive work, the Codex Gingas. And again, Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor, decided that he wanted the book. Now, apparently, he got the book on loan which he never returned. I guess even kings and queens and emperors have a hard time returning their library books. Now, as I said in the opening, people around the court whispered a lot about Rudolf II. Rudolf II was a pretty quiet but yet eccentric man. He liked his occult. He had his closet full of knickknacks. He had the Voynich manuscript and people were suspicious of him being a Satanist or a demonologist. Now, today we do know that the Habsburgs do practice Luciferianism. As for Rudolf himself, I can only speculate that there probably was some Luciferian activity going on, if not with him, then definitely with his family. Now, historically, Rudolf II is not seen as a great leader. As we talked about with the Voynich Manuscript, Rudolf II did struggle with depression or melancholy, and obviously medicine wasn't up to snuff when it came to those types of disorders. Now, we also know that Rudolf was himself pretty much a recluse, a bit like our Herman who wrote the Codex Gingas. Now, Rudolf II, he did contribute a lot to the arts and to sciences, but he just was not that great of a leader. In fact, he didn't even die on the throne. His family pretty much threw him off and gave the crown to his brother because he just couldn't handle being the emperor. And in fact, a lot of people blame the 30 years war in that area of Europe on Rudolf II. You see, when Rudolf II was the emperor. We had a lot of reformation going on in Europe. There was a lot of battling back and forth between Catholics and Protestants and the control of the Pope versus the control of different kings. It's all very complicated. Well, during the Thirty Years' War, the Swedes came in and confiscated the Codex Gingas in 1648. And that's where the Codex Gingas has been ever since. The Codex Gingas now has its home at the National Library of Sweden. Now, the Codex Gingas is also said to be cursed. Apparently, there's been a lot of fires around the Codex Gingas, and apparently in one fire, they threw the Codex Gingas out of the window in attempts to save it, and it actually injured a bystander that was just walking by. So you're walking down the street and all of a sudden a 165 pound book knocks you to the ground. And then come to find out it's not just any book, but it's the devil's Bible. I mean, I would probably feel like God was trying to tell me something if the devil's Bible knocked me out like that. Now again, for me, the jury is still out on whether I actually believe this is a satanic book or just a codex from many, many, many centuries ago. I understand there is a big painting of the devil, but there were lots of paintings of the devil. I understand that in this book, the devil took the right hand side of the page, which is normally given to God, but this might have been just a simple mistake. I don't think I believe the myth of Herman get selling his soul in one night to write this book. I think that might just be an urban legend or a tall tale coming from a very simple explanation that Herman took about 30 years to write it. It was his life's work. Now, again, this is a very important book because it does carry a lot of medical information from that time, as well as an encyclopedia, as well as snippets of information from other historians and scientists that came before Herman. And I do understand why this book is of great occult concern. I understand that there are multiple pages that are missing that possibly carried out some demonic prayer, but we don't know that for sure. 
we don't have the pages to verify that. So I'm left with quite a question in my own head. Is this the devil's Bible? Was this created in the worship of Lucifer? Or did it get that reputation because of the times, because of all the information in the Codex that was seen as satanic back then? And was the myth further perpetrated by its ownership falling to Rudolf II, who already came from an interesting family and already had some rumors swirling around his own beliefs? What do you think? What's your explanation from the Codex Gingis? And have you been to Sweden to see this mysterious book? Let me know in the comments down below. All right, guys, I know this has been a crazy week. We got a lot going on in our world right now, and I hope you guys are all taking really good care of yourself, that you're resting, you're eating healthy, you're getting some exercise. And remember to be compassionate to those that are just now waking up to what is actually happening in our world. Thank you again to Josh McKay for doing our music and to Todd Roderick for helping me produce this video. Again, there's a link to our opening song, the full song, in the description box below. And there's also a link to Todd's band, The Flying Mystics, in our description box below. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.